probably a lot of the men in this congregation that uh, can remember when they were very young. I know for a lot of us that is going back a number of years. Remember as small boys, we watched our fathers shave. And maybe we even pretended to be shaving ourselves at the same time. And we learned how to shave by watching our fathers shave. We were imitators. We were imitators. Even my grandson does that sometimes with me. Imitators. In our text this morning, Paul says... By inspiration, he stresses how Christians, were the children of God, are to be imitators of God, our Heavenly Father. Just as that small boy watched his father learn how to shave, we as Christians go to the Father to learn how to behave, to learn how to act, to learn how to be godly people. Our text this morning, Ephesians chapter 5, as we're working our way through this wonderful book that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, <clears throat> he begins in Ephesians chapter 5 by saying in verse 1, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. He says, God is your heavenly Father. You need to imitate Him. Be like Him. Be like Him in every way. So this lesson and this text is about what does imitating God mean? When He says, be imitators of God, what does that mean? And what does that look like in my life? If I'm imitating God, what am I going to do? How will that affect my daily life? How will my behavior change if I'm imitating God. Well, the first thing he says <clears throat> at the beginning of this is that imitating God means walking or behaving, acting in love. Notice verse 2. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Now, remember when the Bible was written, there were no verses and chapters. So, chapter 4, verse 32 was right before chapter 5, verse 1, and there was no break in there at all. So, notice what chapter 4, verse 32 says. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So, this goes back to what he'd been talking about with... God in Christ forgiving us. He says, you forgive each other because you're imitating God. God forgives you, so you forgive others. Why? You're imitating God. You are being godly when you do that. Children who love their father will imitate his way. That's what children do. The word in the original language that's translated imitators here comes from the word we have mimic. You're to mimic God. You say what God would say. You think what God would think. You act like God would think. That's being godly. That's being holy. That's being righteous. And he says, here is the first example. He says, look at what Christ did. He says, if you're going to walk in love, that means that you're going to look at Christ's example. How did Christ love us? How was that displayed in his life? Well, he says, here's how it was displayed. He did what? He gave himself for us. He offered himself up on the cross. He sacrificed himself. That's the example. If you want to see what walking in love looks like, see what Jesus did. He sacrificed himself on the cross. That's what he did. Did he have to? No. He chose to because he loved us. And love there wasn't just uh, an emotion. He loved us in the sense he did what was the very best thing for us. The very best thing for us was for him to come, leave all the wonders of heaven, come to this earth, 
and take on the same form that we have. The same corruptible body that, that decays and gets old and that hurts and feels pain. That's what he did. When Peter wrote this first epistle in 1 Peter chapter 2, he describes this in a very poignant way. 1 Peter chapter 2 beginning in verse 21 says, For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return. When he suffered he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. That's what he did. He says, look what Jesus did. That's walking in love. Walking in love simply means you do what's best for other people. You do what's best for them. Whatever that might be, that's walking in love. So if you're going to imitate God, then walking in love means doing what's best for other people. And he says, this is to God a sacrifice and a sweet-smelling aroma. You know, when you burn certain types of wood, it just gives the most wonderful smell off. He says, for God, when we walk in love, that's like a sweet-smelling aroma. It goes up to God as a wonderful sacrifice. He says, that's what imitating God means. Walking in love. And then he says, imitating God means being pure in body and in speech. Verse 3 and 4, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. He says if you're imitating God, you're going to be pure in body, pure in speech. So in verse 3, he talks about what being pure in body means. In verse 4, what it means to be pure in speech. So Christians were to imitate our Father. What does that mean? He says, first of all, fornication. All types of sexual immorality, it doesn't make any difference what kind, all of it is not to be even named among us. Not even named, not even considered. People in the world should never hear about God's people who are imitators of God being involved in sexual immorality. That's what he says. says that shouldn't even be named, mentioned among you. Not even mentioned among you. Fornication. And then uncleanness or impurity of any kind. In 1 John chapter 3, John says this <clears throat> in verse 3. 1 John chapter 3 verse 3 says, and everyone who has this hope about being in heaven with the Father purifies himself just as he is pure. Notice the, the mimicking. God is pure. So we're to purify ourselves so that we can be more like God. It's all about imitating God. So imitating God means we have no part in fornication. We have no part in any type of uncleanness. And then he says we have no part in any type of covetousness or idolatry. Putting something ahead of God. And that can be all kinds of things. Sure, that can be money and, and wealth, uh, land, going for prestige. It can be a job. It, I mean, the list is endless of things we can put ahead of God. He says Christians... Children of God, because they're imitating God, shouldn't even have be named that there's any type of idolatry in their lives, that they're putting anything in front of their Father. Nothing whatsoever. Idolatry. It's an unlawful desire for more. Notice what Jesus said about idolatry. Back in Luke 12, <clears throat> Jesus makes this point in verse 15. 
when he says, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. That's, the, that's how most of the world keeps score, isn't it? That's how most of the world keeps score, by how much they have. And they often compare what they have to what other people have. And if they have more than what other people have, they're happy. If they have less than what other people have, they're sad. Jesus says that is not what life is about. So imitating God means not putting any anything above or in front of or having a greater priority than being a child of God. That's to be number one. So he says saints here, Christians, those who are holy, those who are imitating God, they're not to be involved to any extent in these things. He says it's not fitting. God doesn't overlook these things, so we can't excuse them by saying, well, we're just not perfect. You know, some people, and, and hopefully we haven't used that excuse, well, I'm just that type of person. I'm just that type of person. Well, can murderers say that? Well, I'm just that type of person. I just murder people. That's just who I am. I, I don't think God excuses that, does he? No, that's not an excuse. Well, then he talks about our speech. He kind of talked about, you know, our body in, in verse 3. Now, in verse 4, he talks about if we're imitating God, that also means our speech is to be a certain type. He says there's not to be any filthiness or obscenity or vile words coming out of our mouth. Foolish talking. This is the only place this Greek word is used in the entire New Testament. It brings with it the idea of senseless or stupid talk. In other words, it's not profitable in any way to anybody for any reason. Totally useless talk probably would include things like Titus chapter 3 verse 9. Titus chapter 3 verse 9 says, But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. That's what he says. Useless. Then he says, <clears throat> coarse jesting. This word brings with it the idea of things that are lewd, degrading, so any type of lewd, degrading speech or jokes or anything like that, says that is to not be named among you in any way. So instead of spending time in this type of talk, what does he say we're supposed to do? Give thanks. So instead of, of, uh, of, you, of having filthiness or foolish talking or coarse jesting or these type of things, he says instead of doing that, if you're imitating God, then instead give thanks. Let thanks be coming out of your mouth instead of these other things. That's what imitating God looks like in speech. Be a thankful person instead of filling your mouth with these type of words and speech. It says get rid of that. Jesus makes the point that <clears throat> how can sweet water and bitter water come out of the same spring. Well, it can't. So if we're claiming to be holy, which we should be, if we're to be saints, which Christians are, that means people who are consecrated. They're set aside. So we're not to be involved in that same type of, of talk and speech and so forth that the world is involved in. Those things are not to be coming out of our mouths. We're imitators of God. We're mimicking God. And then the last three verses, he says, imitating God means we're not to let ourselves be deceived. Verse 5, For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who's an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now that's pretty straightforward. This is beyond dispute, he says. Nobody that's involved in those things has any place in the kingdom. In Revelation 21, 
we have some of those same things repeated near the end of John's letter. Listen to how similar these are. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable murderers, sexually immoral, moral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Notice some of those similarities. Listen to this, verse 15. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Those who practice such will not be in heaven. He makes that as clear as can be. He says, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived into believing that you can practice those things and that God will still overlook them because He won't. Verse 6, For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who's an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. There have always been those who try to deceive others by saying that you can live any way you want and God will accept it. You can do anything, say anything, and God will accept it. He'll save you anyway. Paul addressed this in Romans chapter 6 when he wrote in verse 1 of that chapter, he said this, Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. Or absolutely not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? No, we can't live any longer in it. That's what he says. He says we do away with it. You read the rest of that chapter. He mentions that over and over and over again. We do away with it. We get rid of that old man of sin. He's gone. Much of the Protestant world today believes this. Once saved, always saved. That once you are saved, it matters not how you live. God will accept you. And that you cannot possibly lose your salvation. That's one of the biggest deceptions and lies that Satan has ever Deceive people into believing. But countless people believe it. And God's wrath will, he says, come upon them. He says, for because of these things, things he's just talked about, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Those people who disobey. In Second Peter chapter 2, Peter writes this, <clears throat> beginning in the first verse, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, destructive teachings, false teachings, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Do you see that? For a long time their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. God's wrath will come upon them. And he ends up by telling them to abstain from participating in the sins of others. Don't, don't participate in their sins. Not in any way. Don't be partakers with them in their sins. So instead of imitating these people, he ends up by saying, make sure you imitate God. So notice how he begins and ends this paragraph in the same way. He says, be imitators of God, not imitators of these men. Look to God for your example. There's good news in this. There's great news in this. If we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we hear this good news about coming out of sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. Paul wrote, 
Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now notice this list. He says, do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. These people will not inherit the kingdom of God if they continue to be fornicators and idolaters and adulterers and thieves and so on. But he says, and such were some of you. Some of them in the Corinthian church, before they became cleansed, before they became Christians, were involved in these things. Fornication, idolatry, uh, they, they were drunkards, they were revilers. But he says, you were washed, but you were sanctified, made holy, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Many of them had been involved in these sins, but, but now they were holy. So instead of imitating the ways of the world, they were imitating the ways of God. They had been washed, sanctified, made holy, justified, pronounced not guilty. They were not under condemnation anymore. There's no better news in the Bible than that. Regardless, regardless of one's background, regardless of what they've been involved in, they can be saved. They can be cleansed. They can be justified. They can be made whole. But they have to first believe. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. They must believe. But that belief doesn't stop at belief. That, that belief causes one to repent, turn their life around. You know, they've been imitating the world, now they're going to start imitating God. In their mind, in their speech, in their behavior. And that repentance leads them to confess before men that that's what they're going to do. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He rose from the dead. And I'm committing my life to Him. And then they go into the waters of baptism understanding that their sins are washed away in that baptism. And as Romans 6, 3 and 4 says, they come up out of those waters a new creation, cleansed and made whole. That's the good news of the Bible. This morning, if anyone is in need of that salvation or if you're in need of prayers of the congregation we want you to come as Danny leads us in this invitation song let's stand and sing please <clears throat>